welcome to Birkbeck, University of London. My name is Dr. Sean Brady, and I'm introducing my colleague, Professor Matt Cook. We're both historians of queer history and gender history here at Birkbeck in the Department of History, Classics and Archaeology. And to mark Pride Month 2021, um, we thought it'd be interesting and useful if Matt and I uh, talk to you and talk to each other about our new research in queer history. Uh, Matt, I'm fully aware that you are completing a book called Queer Beyond London, and I've got some questions on that. Um, why did you come up with the idea of looking at queer beyond London, and what are the implications of examining questions of queer in history beyond London? That's a great foundational question, Sean, for the, for the, for the book. I mean, basically what happened is that I'd always worked actually on London, and um, and of course, it's been a London has been a real focal point because it has a really rich history of queer life, networks, culture, and so on for, um, for for gay men, for lesbians, for trans people. But what became increasingly apparent in the sort of two thousands, um, with a whole upsurge in community LGBTQ history projects, was just how rich uh, queer history was well beyond the capital. Um, and so what we were trying to do in this project was bring some of these community histories, community history project research together, uh, it, sorry, into conversation. Um, and what we began to find when we did that was how distinct local understandings and experiences of queer life, queer community were, and for all sorts of reasons. Um, so uh, to give you one example, uh, we tend to think in, 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 in Britain about 1967 being a pivotal date uh, in the calendar, uh, you know, the, the, the year when uh, homosexual acts were partially decriminalised. But in Plymouth, for example, um, it was virtually an irrelevance because it's because the Navy and the, the armed forces are such an important part of that city that it wasn't until homosexuality in the forces was decriminalised in 2000 that things really began, cultures really began to shift there. And up until that point, there was an incredibly rich queer network and queer culture, but it was very much below the proverbial radar. And I mean, I could give some other examples too. So for example, in, in, uh, in Manchester, if you think of that, the radical history of that, of that town in terms of suffrage and workers' rights, um, and, and uh, we very much see in the, in the sort of 60s, 70s and 80s, Manchester, as much as, if not more at certain points than London, becoming a really important radical center for lesbian and gay activism. And that's really something that ran through right through the eighties um, when you had some of the biggest Clause 28, anti-Clause 28 marches going on in Manchester, partly because of that history and that culture of the town, of, of the city, where they've got a hugely supportive or had at that point a hugely supportive local council as well, who were really, um, um, in a sense, providing some of the structure for that, for, for that activism alongside the student unions and so on in what is, an, is, is, is has a, in a city which has a large student population. And, 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 and you, sorry, you were going to say. <laughs> yes, just to round that up, Matt, that's, that's extremely interesting. And it brings regional dimensions right to the fore and stops us using Britain or the UK as a shorthand for really what queer in London. Huh? Um, I, absolutely. And I think you start realising that, that things, it, it's not just a, a, about events and when things happen, but also how things can feel different. So, you know, for example, being proud in Brighton is very much about being visible and out there. Being proud, we, we found in interviews in Plymouth, people were proud of, 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 of not standing out, of functioning below the radar, of, of sustaining community, sustaining networks without confronting work, com coming into uh, conflict with work or family. So there's a very different sense of what pride meant in different contexts, which is to do with the local economy, the sort of work people were doing, you know, your local histories and so on. So it's a really fascinating project in terms of what shapes our experience and understandings of sexuality. It's, it's interesting because all our, all our case studies um, in the work we were doing for Queer Beyond London were, fo were focused actually on English cities and English, English regions. Um, but we became acutely aware of how the different national and regional contexts matter uh, to lesbian and gay life. Um, and that's really made me reflect on the work you're doing, Sean, on Northern Ireland and the difference, that very particular 
context makes. And I know what you're doing there, um, you know, you're, you're really breaking new ground because uh, it's work that hasn't been done before. So I wondered if you could fill us in a little bit more on, on, on what you found that found, found in relation to the province. Well, yes, of course. And thank you for that question, Matt. Um, researching sexualities, gender and sexual difference in general in Northern Ireland is very difficult indeed. Um, for start off, there's little or no scholarship in the area. Um, and as a queer locale, Northern Ireland is rarely considered by scholars. Uh, scholars of Northern Ireland tend to be uh, a bit obsessed with the sectarian divide rather than uh, other forms of minorities in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is in the news a lot lately for various reasons, but especially for the hostility of many of its politicians who are very verbose uh, to LGBT equalities and also women's reproductive rights. Northern Ireland is really quite different from the other nations of the United Kingdom in this respect. Sexual identities in Northern Ireland and also the challenge to LGBT lives there is different from the rest of the United Kingdom or indeed the Republic of Ireland these days. Northern Ireland's society and culture have long created a hostile environment for LGBTQ people Society, culture and politics are riven with religious sectarianism and also legacies of violence. The habitus of religion and also sectarianism remains deeply ingrained in Northern Ireland and um, sectarianism defines social existence there. Evangelicals, um, especially within the Democratic Unionist Party, have deliberately targeted LGBT rights, lives and individuals since the 1970s. Now, the LGBT response, including in this month's Gay Pride, is really rather interesting in recent years um, because LGBT, uh, the LGBT backlash against all of this oppression has been extremely lively, cultural and assertive. And the countercultural response, especially through LGBT arts organisations such as Outburst, have been significant. Now, uh, indeed, uh, the political assertiveness and also the cultural scene for LGBT people in Northern Ireland is much more vibrant than you'll find in British cities today, where mm -hmm. those kind of arts expressions of, of freedom and you know, fighting oppression um, seem to have declined. Whereas in Northern sounds, Ireland... Sounds like, the, sounds like you're describing some British cities in the 1990s, for example, or late 80s. Exactly, and that's happening in Northern Ireland today. So there's a strong generational gap in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, up until a few years ago, uh, Northern Ireland, this is through social surveys, Northern Ireland has been established to be one of the most bigoted societies in the developed world, I'm afraid, yeah? And yet, within the rest of the United Kingdom, you can find some of the most liberal and enlightened attitudes towards LGBT mm. life. So, so the United Kingdom itself is, is, is something of a paradox in terms of attitudes towards people's individual freedoms, you know, and Brexit isn't helping that. And, uh, and it is fascinating to the scholar, I think, that the, the sheer vibrancy of, of uh, the cultural response to all of this oppression in Northern Ireland is symptomatic of the oppression of the society. Mm -hmm. It's within. So, so that robustness of response comes out of yeah. um, the kind of sectarianism, se sectarian homophobia and so on. Well, it's a bit like uh, in, in, in France, there was a basic legal toleration of sex between men because of the Code Napoleon law, and very little in the way of LGBT politics in the 1970s. Whereas in Britain, because of the criminality of sex between men and its legacies, uh, organizations such as the Gay Liberation Front and Gay Sweatshop and other cultural LGBT organizations tended to be much, much more assertive because they had to be to achieve yeah. anything in Britain. But, but what's interesting emerging out of both are work, I, I think, Sean, is, is, is really showing how it's very difficult to talk about uh, the, 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 the story, the LGBT story or the queer story of the United, the United Kingdom in any homogenous way, that actually we, we find in London something quite distinct, something distinct in the South West, something very distinct in, in Manchester, Scotland, Wales, where other important work has been going on. And then, of course, distinct again in Northern Ireland. And if there's, a sh if there's some shared contours, there's huge variety in terms of the kind of expressions and understandings of sexuality and indeed of normality and homophobia um, a, a, a alongside that. Absolutely. And um, those differences, those sharp differences in certain uh, respects, remind us as scholars that we always need to situate uh, our discussion right in the, you know, the context of the politics and 
gendered expectations of the of, of the locale, whether it be Northern Ireland, Scotland, or the cities of England. It's, it's really interesting. We, we found that actually looking at, st at, at, at factors that wouldn't immediately present as relevant, for example, the local economy, local demographics, um, you know, the, the kind of work people were doing, um, the kind of workplace identity, all these things can feed into the experience or expectations of community. You know, much more, many more small holding, small businesses in, uh, in Brighton than in Manchester, for example. And very different again in Plymouth, where, there, where there's such reliance on the, on, on the Navy and the docks. And each of those different kind of economic and workplace cultures seems to have shaped attitudes to sexuality and ideas of kind of radical action and individualism.